Welcome back for part two of our tobacco lectures. Uh, we're going to kick off here by talking about current cigarette use. Uh, we do actually see higher rates of smoking in men than women here in the United States, about a quarter of the male population, about a fifth of the female population. And one of the things that we see consistently across all populations is this idea that education is our single biggest influence. Uh, if we look at how this breaks down, uh, folks who have only a high school diploma, 28% of them are smokers. Uh, those who go on to complete college, 11%. Uh, we also see just with in the student population, about 5% of full-time college students are smokers, uh, and their peers who do not go on to college, about 19%. So we see this consistent across populations, and we know one of the things that truly seems to impact cigarette use is education level. Um, so an interesting trend in tobacco use was this trend of uh, smokeless tobacco or chewing tobacco. Uh, we saw it kind of uh, rise up again in the 1970s uh, as we saw those lung concerns, those lung cancer concerns become more prevalent in the 1970s. Um, so the most common form here in the United States is related to snuff, but a moist snuff, the uh, um, uh, tobacco like Skoll and uh, Copenhagen, where the nicotine is actually absorbed through the mucous membrane. So it's still a nicotine product, uh, but it's not actually smoked. Um, now there were some changes, some different kinds of uh, health outcomes, less likely to cause lung cancer because the tobacco is not being inhaled into the lungs, uh, and generally less expensive, uh, and also under some circumstances more socially acceptable as the um, social bias against producing smoke that those around you need to breathe in grows, uh, it, became, uh, slightly, uh, it became a slightly more socially acceptable way to consume uh, tobacco. Um, but it does also have its own health risks, and we still see those warning labels on smokeless tobacco packages. Uh, and we are still looking at cancer concerns, although oral cancer is the concern that's more strongly related to smokeless tobacco. Uh, also other kinds of dental diseases um, and conditions like leukoplakia, where we've got uh, thicker, whitish uh, lesions in the mouth. Um, we typically see uh, incidences of oral cancer in those same areas. And of course, there's the risk for nicotine dependence that goes with that as well. So it is still a, um, a substance that leads to dependence regardless of how it is consumed. Uh, some other tobacco products, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have seen this recent increase in cigar smoking. Uh, in 2008, we were back up to 9% of males and 2% of females reporting smoking a cigar, so some increases there. Uh, and then uh, hookahs. So this is one that's particularly important to discuss with, I think, undergrad populations. So pretty familiar with what hookahs are, those large ornate water pipes. Uh, and they do produce a milder, sometimes even flavored smoke, but it is still a tobacco product uh, and it still is definitely associated with health risk. So just a little bit of comparison between smoking cigarettes and smoking hookah. Uh, so a typical cigarette involves 20 puffs, so 20 times that uh, nicotine is inhaled into the lungs, where a typical hookah session actually involves 200 puffs. So a great deal more that's inhaled. If we look at that in terms of volume, a uh, typical cigarette when smoked, Five to 600 milliliters of smoke are inhaled. Uh, in a typical hookah session, that's actually 90,000 milliliters. So even if you do it less often, uh, the volume is so much greater uh, and it is still a nicotine product, so it's still, um, it's still a tobacco product, so it still involves those health risks that we associate with tobacco use. So hookah, um, although it may taste sweeter and smell different, uh, still definitely includes uh, health risk as well. Uh, if we're going to dig into those little those health risks a little more carefully, uh, definitely lung cancer. That's one that most people are familiar with. Uh, smoking is also a major contributor to cardiovascular disease, our top killer of Americans, uh, and to other kinds of respiratory diseases such as emphysema. Um, and we see a greater risk for those who start young, those who smoke more, and those who smoke for a long time. So anything that increases your exposure or starts your exposure younger uh, is something that will increase the level of risk that you experience. Uh, and we do know that despite our issues with diet and exercise here in the United States, that smoking is still our greatest, our single greatest avoidable cause of death. Uh, so definitely a behavior to consider modifying if it's one that you currently engage in. Uh, we do know, um, we've discussed it just in our earlier lecture about those warning labels that are required. Uh, if you ever see those uh, and they appear to be different, uh, that's actually accurate. Their uh, companies are required to rotate between different warning levels, um, I'm sorry, warning labels, uh, and to keep those messages fresh in the minds of smokers. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit now about uh, secondhand smoke. So secondhand smoke, uh, this is the uh, smoke that you inhale uh, if you're in the same environment as a smoker. So as a non-smoker, the kinds of things that are entering your lungs anyway. Um, we've got a couple of different ways that it's classified. Uh, we've got mainstream smoke, and this is the smoke that the smoker is inhaling and exhaling. And then we've got side stream smoke. So this is the independent smoke that's coming off of the end of the cigarette. Um, so there are more carcinogens in side stream smoke, uh, but the smoke is more diluted. So mainstream smoke is slightly less dangerous and the one that most of us are exposed to. We've actually got some really interesting research lately on actually third hand smoke. Um, and this would be if you imagine, say, maybe a uh, person who works on the casino floor in Las Vegas, um, comes home, uh, gets in their car, uh, they still got that smoke smell attached to their clothing, maybe it kind of leaches into the car a bit, they come home, they take the clothing off. Anybody who's in the room with them um, inhaling, we can all of course smell that, uh, most of us can, the residual smoke on the, uh, the, per the non-smoker in that environment, even if that person doesn't smoke themselves, um, then that anybody who's in the environment of the, uh, the objects that have been in the presence of the smoke is now breathing in that third hand smoke. So some research that indicates that's risky as well. As I mentioned, that area of third hand smoke research is fairly new. We don't have a lot of um, quality research coming out of that area just yet, but we do have an extensive body of research on second hand smoke. And what we've learned <coughs> excuse me, is that the health effects of second smoke, secondhand smoke are difficult to, to fully determine. Uh, it's difficult to put numbers around what that actually means. But the conditions that we're concerned about are lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, and the secondhand smoke has been classified by the EPA as a human carcinogen since 1993. And we're seeing a new trend towards uh, clean air legislation to protect non-smokers from being exposed to that health risk. Uh, and actually, cities that have passed clean air legislation have seen really interesting changes in um, heart attack rates, not just um, not among smoking populations, but among non-smokers. It's been really interesting to see how people who don't smoke but have heart disease are less likely to have heart attacks when they're not exposed to secondhand smoke. So we might see some more conclusive data coming as that kind of legislation becomes more and more common. Okay, so if you look at smoking and health in other countries, um, we still see this as a worldwide problem, actually worse in some developing countries than in uh, the United States at this time. Uh, about 5 million deaths every single year attributable to smoking. Uh, and as the behavior spreads, it might be as high as 8 million uh, within the next decade and a half or so. Uh, we've seen dramatic changes in markets such as Asia, uh, where their demand for American cigarettes has dramatically increased, along with other developing countries as well. Part of this is as the uh, markets for uh, tobacco in the United States have decreased, the tobacco companies have reached uh, overseas and abroad for uh, new populations to market their products to. Uh, so some of this is associated with change in uh, living standards in those countries and then also with marketing efforts by tobacco companies. So uh, smoking in pregnancy is a, another thing where we've seen cultural norms change dramatically. Uh, I think many of us looking at this image of the pregnant woman lighting up a cigarette kind of cringe, uh, but this was actually a very common behavior among pregnant women uh, just a generation or two ago. Uh, but what we've learned is that smoking while pregnant is associated with increased risk for poor pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage, a low birth weight for the infant, and then also a higher risk for sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, once the, after the infant's born. Um, and we've also got some studies that indicate some longer term effects that uh, babies who are exposed to tobacco smoke in utero uh, may experience some physiological and cognitive issues, uh, including neurological problems, uh, some problems with reading and math, and then also possibly higher risk for hyperactivity. Uh, so some interesting um, results that we need to continue to investigate uh, because we only have a few studies that are indicating this and it would increase our desire to uh, help women who become pregnant to quit smoking if this continues to be a lifetime risk for the children that are born in that situation. Uh, so we're going to wrap up our uh, second lecture for tobacco here and we'll come back uh, for our third lecture to talk about the pharmacology of nicotine.